Good morning, and welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent. As you know, the uh, mask mandates and other COVID mandates have been lifted throughout the province. When our council met last week, we have determined that we will continue to require masking here to help people feel comfortable being in the space. Um, and also, part of that is so that we can continue to sing together. Um, we know that that produces more aerosols, right? And so, um, so that we can continue that practice, we're going to continue to ask you to mask when you come to Bethany for the time being. <laughs> Um, we have um, an opportunity to meet with Bruce and Anne, our facilitators from Faith Care again, for a new series of listening circles. And I'm going to invite Mary to come forward and tell you about that and tell you how to sign up. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, this is uh, a letter that will be actually emailed to each and every one. Um, but I'm going to read it to you just so that you know what the questions and so forth are. We're pleased to invite you to take part in a listening circle. A listening circle provides a small group of people the opportunity to listen to each other about a topic or an issue that is having a significant impact on them personally and on the church family. The focus of the listening circles we are offering is the impact of the sale of the church building. Uh, uh, listening circles are not discussions or debates. They are a time to share, listen, connect, and gain a shared understanding of each other's perspective and experience. As well as listening to each other, there will be the opportunity to decide as a group what, if anything, you want to share with the council and with the congregation. We will use the following questions during the listening circles. What are your thoughts about the sale of the church building? How are you and others affected by the sale? What's the hardest thing for you about the sale of the church building? What's the hardest thing for our faith community? What are some opportunities for Bethany given the sale of the church building? What needs to happen to move forward as a congregation given the sale of the building? What are you willing to do to help our faith community move forward at this time of transition. What key thoughts would you like to share with council and the congregation? When participating in a listening circle, you have the opportunity to speak and to listen. To help you prepare and decide if you would like to take part, please reflect on the following questions. Am I prepared to listen deeply to those I may not agree with? Am I prepared to share my experience and perspective, even if others disagree with me? Am I prepared to sit in discomfort if people express a lot of emotion? We will be offering listening circles at the following times, April the 7th, which is Palm Sunday, 7 to 9, or, or sorry, April 7th is not Palm Sunday. <laughs> April 7th is um, the online, is it April? Yes. It's the online one. But yeah. April, I thought it was April the 1st. Oh, okay. April the 10th, 1045 to 1245, and 2 to 4 p.m. at the church. Those will be in person. Um, please sign up for your preferred time slot. Um, Pastor Jennifer will have details about how to do that, which I can tell you I have sign-up sheets at the back of the church right now and will be right up until the time of the announcements. Um, please consider carefully and sign up. It will help us to get reconnected with each other. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Those who participated in the first series of listening circles, I think, had a positive experience and um, a, good, a good opportunity to deeply listen to one another. So I do encourage you to, um, to sign up for a time that works for you. We're going to start our worship today with a, a small, a short song. The words are simple and they will be um, posted on the screen. God is here today, as certain as the air I breathe, 
as certain as the morning sun that rises, as certain when I sing, you'll hear my song. I'll sing it through once for you, and then I'll invite you to join me, and we'll sing it through two or three times. In the name of God, who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again, and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward, and you embrace us all with your mercy. 
By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear the reading of God's word. The first reading is from Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 to 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. The day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, on leavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day. They ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Cana that year. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 32, and we will read it together responsively by whole verse. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. Second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the gospel. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. 
The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he went off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves quickly, Bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a single young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I'm going to begin my sermon this morning by turning to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians as the basis for my preaching, at least at least to begin. I will get to the gospel too, I promise, because oh my, what a story. But the reason I'm choosing to begin in Paul's letter 
is because I want to tell you a little, a, a little bit about a church in turmoil. Because I believe that the situation in Corinth during Paul's ministry there has much to say to us today. The church in Corinth was divided and Paul faced polarization amongst the people. Now, Paul's church wasn't trying to recover from a pandemic. The people in Paul's church were not feeling conflicted about their church budget or experiencing hard feelings about making decisions about their church property. But the issue they were dealing with was just as divisive. The Corinthians were divided over who was in and who was out, and they were basing their opinions on how well the membership was following the law. The issue was circumcision. You see, one side demanded it, and the other deemed it unnecessary. As their leader, Paul had a somewhat rocky relationship with the community at Corinth. And the first letter he wrote to them emphasized love as the best way for the church to live. Again, in today's passage from his second letter, Paul implored the people to look beyond the outward appearance and instead to look into one another's hearts and to reconcile with God and with each other. But Paul had his critics, as all public figures do when they have to get up in front of people week after week and speak to certain situations and concerns. Government leaders, health experts, scientists, judges, and yes, even pastors. On one of his visits to Corinth, it seems that Paul had a little bit of a run-in with one of the members of the congregation, and this caused Paul much pain, not just because of the damage done to their personal relationship, but because the church community did not immediately come to Paul's support or defense. And then, when the church finally did defend Paul, it seems they went overboard in their punishment of Paul's critic, causing the man to be shamed and to be shunned from the community. And so Paul wrote another letter, a letter that has been lost to us, but to which Paul refers several times in 2 Corinthians. We call it the Letter of Tears in which Paul had intended to communicate his love and concern for the community, but which the Corinthians interpreted as a letter of rebuke instead. In a community that was already struggling, Paul's letter made things even worse. Ah, relationships. They are messy things, aren't they? family relationships, friendships, relationships between governments and citizens, and even relationships within the body of Christ, the church, or maybe especially in the church. Relationships here are messy because we always hope that people will know better or act better we have high expectations and standards that we hope will be met by the community of faith, forgetting sometimes that walking through the doors of the church building does not suddenly transform us into perfect people. Unfortunately, even in the church, we still hurt each other. We still make decisions from uninformed or selfish positions. We still fear that which is unfamiliar, and we push away those who think and act differently. We try not to, but we do. 
And so Paul writes his letter from the perspective of one who has been pained, first by an individual and then by a community that didn't support him. He also writes as one who has seen the first offender punished by the community through exclusion from the community. And while that may sound like a satisfactory crime and punishment outcome, this was not Paul's desire. Instead, he calls for a different way of dealing with one who has offended, not just him, but the whole community with his actions. He calls for the church to show forgiveness and offer consolation. His concern is that the one who hurt him may end up feeling the same angst Paul himself did when he was excluded from the community. Indeed, he urges the church to reaffirm their love for the individual. Now, Jesus had a few things to say about forgiveness. Peter once asked him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven times. Now, this is not some mathematical formula for forgiveness. For Matthew, who recorded this encounter in his gospel, the number seven had special significance. The number seven signified completeness. So when Jesus tells Peter he must forgive 70 times, seven times, he is really saying to forgive completely, that forgiveness must be a way of life. But forgiveness as a way of life presents a tremendous challenge, doesn't it? It's challenging because I think many of us have absorbed certain beliefs about forgiveness. Perhaps we have learned that forgiveness means to excuse or to overlook the harm that has been done to us, to say, it's okay when it's not. Or perhaps we have been led to believe that forgiveness means allowing those who have hurt us to persist in their behavior. Or that forgiving requires forgetting what has happened. Or that forgiveness is something we can do at will and always all at once. I'll be honest with you. If this is actually what forgiveness is, I will never be able to make forgiveness a way of life. And so if you, like me, have absorbed any of these distorted beliefs about forgiveness, it can come as both a shock and a relief to learn that such ideas would be foreign to Jesus. Clearly, Jesus expects us, even requires us, to forgive. Yet in his teaching about forgiveness, nowhere does Jesus lay upon us the kinds of burdens we have often placed upon ourselves, burdens that can make one of the most difficult spiritual practices nearly impossible. The heart of forgiveness is not to be found in excusing harm or allowing it to go unchecked. It is to be found, rather, in choosing to say that although our wounds will change us, we will not allow them to define us forever. Forgiveness does not ask us to forget the wrong done to us, but instead to resist the ways it seeks to get its poisonous hooks in us. Forgiveness asks us to acknowledge and to reckon with the damage so that we will not live forever in its grip. I wonder if that's the point of today's gospel parable. I always recognized myself in the older son, the one who refused to enter the party his father was holding for that bratty little brother who squandered his inheritance. 
but both as a mother and as your pastor, I identify more and more with the father in the story. Now please, don't take this to mean that either my children or my congregation have squandered their lives. Nothing could be further from the truth. What I mean is that I know what it is to feel the pain of having my life's work criticized, my priorities, loyalties, and motives questioned. I know what it is to be rejected by those I love most deeply. And so I identify with the Father. I know what he feels when he sees that first glimpse of his lost son making his way home. His joy is mine, and his hope is mine too. The father won't forget what the son did. He will always bear that scar. Neither will he overlook his son's actions. He may never again trust him with his money or his property, and he will set clear boundaries with this son so that nothing more may be lost. And he will not allow his son to treat him with disrespect. And the father will forgive his son so that he does not become bitter and resentful. The father will forgive so that he can continue to find joy in his work, his land, and his family. The father will forgive so that his heart may remain soft for love. Sometimes we are given the grace to forgive quickly. Sometimes the grace to forgive takes a long, long time. Forgiveness will always require practice, a choice to work at it. We might have to chip away at it again and again and again, 70 times, seven times at least, as Jesus says. And forgiveness might well be the hardest blessing we will ever offer or receive. As with any difficult practice, it's important to ask not only for the strength we will need for it, but also the grace that will, as we practice again and again, begin to shimmer through our wounds, drawing us toward the healing and the freedom we could hardly have imagined at the outset. The Hardest Blessing by Jan Richardson. If we cannot lay aside the wound, then let us say it will not always bind us. Let us say the damage will not eternally determine our path. Let us say the line of our life will not forever follow the tearing the rending we have borne. Let us say that forgiveness can take some practice, can take some patience, can take a long and struggling time. Let us say that to offer the hardest blessing, we will need the deepest grace, that to forgive the sharpest pain, we will need the fiercest love, that to release the ancient ache, we will need new strength for every day. Let us say the wound will not be our final home, that through it runs a road, a way we would not have chosen but on which we will finally see forgiveness so long practiced coming toward us, shining with the joy so well deserved. The hardest blessing.
which I think you know when we've been here 10,000 years. When we've been here 10,000. Bright shining as the sun. Bright shining as the sun. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Jesus formed the disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world plagued by fear and condemnation. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make the land to produce a harvest that sustains your entire creation. Equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil. Nourish the earth with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Heal grounds tainted by pollution or misuse. Merciful God, countries are divided and leaders harbor grudges. Reconcile nations that experience conflict. We pray especially for Ukraine and Russia. Act quickly to bring an end to war. Anoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of collaboration among political rivals. Merciful God, your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing hardships. 
Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving. We pray especially today for Carl and Muriel and all those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Console us with the promise that everything can become new. Merciful God, your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding ministries in our community. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Merciful God, the one who was dead is alive again. And we give thanks for those who have died, confident that steadfast love surrounds them. Shelter them in your love until we are gathered at your heavenly banquet. Merciful God, accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need and for the sake of of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast where you offer us the food that satisfied. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore his death, resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered around the table by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Here is food and drink for the journey. Take it and be filled. I'll serve one side and you serve the other side, okay? body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body and blood of Christ given for you. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Blessed Jesus, in this rich meal of grace, you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. I invite you to stand for the blessing. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. And if you give me a moment, I will accompany our last hymn on the organ. <laughs>
Jesus meets you on the way.